Great. And with that, I'd like to welcome everyone to the LA Birders webinar for tonight. Tonight, we're really privileged and uh, tickled, actually, to have Dave Bell here, who's going to talk about Cormorant ID. And uh, we're looking forward to that. But before we get there, hint, hint, change, change. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh oh. Before we get there, ah, there we go. Uh, next month, um, on our first webinar of the month, which is on the second Tuesday, we're going to have Dan Cooper here, who will talk about urban tolerance of <clears throat> nesting birds in the LA region. As you know, Dan's done a lot of work, not only in uh, LA County in the LA region, but specifically with uh, nesting birds and tolerances and things like that. So we're looking forward to that. That'll be wonderful. And uh, then on the following <laughs> Tuesday, we're going to have Marky, Marky Mutchler, Mutchler, is that the way you pronounce it? Yes. Here, and she's a techni research technician at the Moore Labs here at um, Oxy, and she'll be talking about nocturnal fly calls. So it's going to be a great, great month for birding webinars. And please don't tell me you missed a webinar. But if you did, no problem, no problemo. Go to our website at labirders.org, click on the webinars tab, and you can browse through all the webinars. We have well over 50 that are online now, and choose the one you would like to see or re see. Re -see? Can you say that? Re see? I don't re -see know. Re -see again. Is a, yeah. Oh, see. Yeah. Or, you, or you can see. Probably not a good, good word. Yeah. yeah. Or you can see it again. Uh, we have our next Palachic trip coming up on September 24th. It's going to leave out of Marina del Rey. And uh, we only have one space left on that Palachic trip. So if you're interested, sign up quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I was getting a little uh, settled. And now I must settle. Oh, I'm just, just trying that. to get the mood again. <laughs> Uh, LA Birder students, Susan, can you please tell us a little bit? I can. We have a great group of students. Many of them are on right now. Uh, they're the future ornithologists and conservationists, photographers, artists, uh, community scientists, bird banders, uh, volunteers. They're a great group. If you're interested or know somebody who's interested, just shoot us an email and we're happy to get in touch with you. And where should they send that email? Oh, students at labirders.org. Great. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you. Thank you. And Lance, can you tell us a little bit about community science? Uh, yes, I'd be glad to. So uh, to, to reiterate uh, something we mentioned uh, in the uh, talk a week ago, we have a couple of uh, informal community science projects that uh, we're, we're uh, launching. Uh, the first one is an informal survey of the uh, shorebirds along the Los Angeles River, <laughs> actually everything along the Los Angeles River. Um, there are two dates when we're doing this August 27th and uh, September 11th. Um, <clears throat> if you uh, think you might be able to cover some stretch of the river, um, please uh, go ahead and send us an email uh, at uh, science at labirders.org um, to let us know where you think you might actually cover so that we can uh, try to fill the holes that uh, occur elsewhere. And please report your observations in eBird. Um, and if you'd be so kind, uh, send us a link to the eBird lists. And we're going to post a summary of that. We'll, we'll discuss it um, during a future talk, maybe the one uh, in about a month. And uh, we'll also post a summary in the listserv. And secondly, um, red crossbills are coming. Uh, the map on the right shows the distribution of red crossbills in California and southern Nevada as of about a week ago. And uh, the red ones are the most recent observations. And uh, the numbers have been shooting up pretty quickly. And so if you are out in the field and you encounter red crossbills, um, please help us understand the distributions of the different flight call types by recording them. Um, your phone could do very well at this. They're very sensitive. We'd be glad to help you out with uh, figuring out what you found. So please record them and upload the sounds to eBird. And um, thanks a lot. Great. Thank you very much. And you uh, just a final reminder that your lab's uh, membership really helps support us in... Um, by putting on these live webinars 
uh, by rec our recorded webinars. We have to maintain our, our uh, website and connections and things like that. And of course, uh, development of local field ornithology projects, such as the upcoming uh, bird atlas. So uh, please, please help support lab and we appreciate your support. And with that, I would like to reintroduce or introduce again, I guess. Or okay, reintroduce. Reintroduce, Susan. I think, is a word. Yeah. Okay, reintroduce Susan Gilland, who will right. introduce our speaker for tonight. Okay, thank you, Ron. We can't uh, seem to. We're having some technical difficulties on our end, so uh, uh -oh. maybe we can just stop sharing, and you can look at David. If <laughs> Um, thanks so much. In Los Angeles, Birders is very pleased to host Dr. David Bell tonight. Dave is no stranger to many of us. He's a native Southern California, and he's been into birds and birding nearly his entire life. Growing up, Dave spent a lot of time volunteering with nature-related activities, but his career path took him on a path where he focused on engineering and business. David earned his undergraduate degree in physics from Harvard University, where he worked as a research assistant to Ernest Mayer and was an ornithology research assistant to Raymond Painter in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Dave earned his master's in business administration from Columbia University and his PhD in robotics from the University of Michigan. During his career, Dave spent much of his efforts devoted to improving the environment and he says his most fun project was helping to create the Riva Electric Car Company, which is now called the Mahindra Car Company in India. So with Dave's background in science and business, it's not surprising that Dave became interested in promoting eBird as a tool for collecting data to help in bird population monitoring and conservation, especially in the tropics. Dave led or supported the development of apps for birders, including eBird Mobile, Merlin and Bird's Eye, as well as several field guide apps. Today, Dave is the CEO and president of the Bird's Eye app, is the CEO of Grand Care Health Services, serves on the board of Los Angeles Birders, has an active young family, and despite all this, his interest and expertise in birds and bird identification remains solid. Tonight, Dave will walk us through the identification challenges of the four species of cormorants that commonly occur in Southern California. So please welcome Dr. David Bell. All right, thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. And here, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's see if I can do this. <clears throat> there we go. There we go. So go. Uh, panelists tell me if I'm not doing this right, but- uh, Looking well, thank great. You, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction and um, I, uh, I have to admit, I'm a little nervous giving, giving this presentation. There's many people who know a lot more about cormorants than I do, probably including some on this on this uh, webinar. But um, I, uh, I I certainly found it fun and interesting researching them and uh, thinking about you know my own observations. And so I look forward to sharing them. So without uh, any further ado, I'm going to dive in. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There we go. So just briefly uh, background on cormorants. So cormorants, there's about 40 species in the family of Phalacrocoridae. No, this is such a hard one for me. Phalacrocoridae. Anyway, I, I'm not going to try that again. So um, they're called cormorants and shags. And um, in different parts of the world, they're tending to be called cormorants or shags. There's no kind of categorical difference between those two groups. They're somewhat interchangeable, but generally the shags are the ones with crests and prettier plumage. Um, there are about seven main groups of cormorants. And in Southern California, we have two of those seven groups represented. So there's one group which includes neotropic cormorants and double crested cormorants, which are um, now considered a uh, separate genus. Um, along with the Japanese cormorant, which is the one that's famous as the, the domesticated cormorant that people use for fishing. They put the ring around its neck so that when it used to fish, it, uh, it can't swallow it and fishermen use it. And um, I think of that as the freshwater cormorants. Um, then there's the Brands cormorant and the Pelagic cormorant, which are in the uh, genus Eurele. And um, these guys I think of as the saltwater cormorants at least in Southern California. There are many other saltwater cormorants, but in Southern California, we have freshwater cormorants and saltwater cormorants. 
And um, so as an aside, um, the Urele group also includes the red-faced cormorant, which is the specialty of the Bering Strait area, and an extinct species, which um, I didn't know about until I researched this, but it's called the spectacled cormorant. And uh, so it, it should not be surprising that it's extinct because the person who discovered it uh, described it as delicious. So um, that it was uh, nearly flightless and delicious. So that was not a, a auspicious uh, start for that species when it was discovered. Um, cormorants range around the world, except for the Central Pacific Islands. So they're pretty much worldwide. Um, they have web feet that can swim incredibly well. If you haven't already done so, you can go to the pier at like, you know, Venice Beach or, or any pier and you can look down into the water and cormorants are just unbelievable swimmers. They can go super deep in the water and they can, you know, they're obviously fast enough to catch fish. So they're, uh, they're you know, pretty fast if they can catch fish. Um, <clears throat> they have relatively short wings given their size because they have this trade-off between wanting to be able to use their wings underwater for swimming and also wanting to be able to use their wings for flying, uh, which, you know, would lead to different wing designs, um, and but they want to be able to do both. So it turns out that they are one of the, <laughs> they can just barely fly. They have to run on the water and and get get going, and they use more energy to fly than any other group of birds. Um, similar sexes are similar, generally speaking. Um, you can't normally distinguish the male and the female from, by their plumage. Generally speaking, on average, females are a little bit duller, but you know, you can't even tell by looking at them, but the males are consistently larger. So typically when you see a pair, you can see that there's a bigger one and a smaller one uh, for most species of cormorants, all the species we have. Okay, so normally when you go out bird watching and you see cormorants, you see something like this um, or this, you know, or this, or this. And, um, you know, normally these are small black birds that are, you know, half a mile away. And so they're, they're kind of hard to identify the normal way we think about identifying where you say, oh, it's got this mark and this mark and this mark. Um, you know, oftentimes cormorants are too far away to really identify that way. So what we need to be able to do to identify them is think about other other things besides just field marks. So most important is status and distribution. I'll talk about that for a minute. Um, structure is super important. I mean, between structure and status and distribution, you can identify almost any cormorant in our area. Um, and if you happen to get close enough to it or get a photo, field marks will even do the job. So um, I'll start with status and distribution. So first of all, I'm gonna start with what I'm calling the saltwater species. So again, this is genus Urele. Um, and so the first is the Brant's cormorant. The Brant's cormorant is the common of the saltwater species in our area, and the pelagic is the less common of the two. Um, so Brant's cormorants are common to abundant in tidal and saltwater areas. Um, they range of the Pacific coast of North America, and they, they go down to the Gulf of California, so you know down in Mexico, all the way up to southern Alaska. The total population in Southern California is in the neighborhood of 6,000 pairs, um, many of which are on the Channel Islands, um, but you can certainly see large concentrations along the coast of, of LA County. So, you know, Marina del Rey Breakwater or LA, you know, Harbor, San Pedro, you can see a thousand birds. Um, if you, you know, well, last weekend we saw a thousand birds going along the breakwater. Um, <clears throat> it's a dominant species. So anywhere there's salt water, this is gonna be the dominant species. Um, estuaries, coastal rocks, offshores, around the Channel Islands, pretty much any random spot you stop along uh, the shore of LA County, you, you know, if you look around long enough, you're gonna find a branch cormorant. Um, this is the only species that's expected out, you know, in the ocean. So if you're more than about a mile offshore, maybe two, there's, you know, there's a very, very high probability that any cormorant is going to be a brant's cormorant. Um, <clears throat> there are, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because even for our most strictly coastal species, usually at least a few of them wind up as vagrants inland, but this species almost never occurs inland. In fact, the, the furthest inland record I could find in Southern California was by Kim Moore, who's a birder in LA. Um, who had one at Dominguez Gap in the LA River, and that's only a mile and a half from tidal water, salt water. So um, that's kind of amazing, I think. Um, 
there's zero records from the Salton Sea, there's zero records from the Antelope Valley. I mean, this just does not occur inland at all. Um, so believe it or not, the Pelagic Cormorant is even more strictly coastal than the Brant's Cormorant. Um, there is one record I could find somewhat inland in Orange County and that's it. Um, so pelagic is a northern Pacific species. It occurs all the way from Baja, northern Baja, California. So we're near the southern end of its range, all the way around to about the same latitude um, in Korea. Um, the total population is around 5,000 pairs. Um, and my, my rough guess is that LA County doesn't have very many pairs, you know, maybe 50 pairs, if, you know, some, some number in that kind of range. Um, and uh, so, uh, the pelagic cormorant is much, much less common than the brant. So if you are on the coast in California and you see a cormorant, high probability it's a brant unless proven otherwise. But, the, but there are pelagics out there. Typically, you know, you got to look through maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand brant cormorants to find one pelagic cormorant. And in fact, last weekend on the breakwater, there were about a thousand brant cormorants and one pelagic cormorant that we saw. Um, they, they are very, very sedentary and they spend almost all their time right around breeding colonies, which are on cliffs. Um, so, you know, there's a few places and, you know, basically around the Palisades Peninsula and out on the islands are the best places to see these guys. Um, and like I said, they're even more strictly uh, coastal than, um, than brands. Okay, so now the freshwater species, the double-crested and neotropic. Um, so double-crested cormorant, again is the common one and the neotropic cormorant is the rare one. Um, double crested is common anywhere in freshwater and brackish habitat. So um, they do overlap with brands because they will occur in, in brackish water. So they'll occur in estuaries and harbors and so on where, where there's also brands. But they aren't really oceanic species. So they're not gonna, you know, you'll see them, see them sometimes feeding in the ocean. Um, but, you know, where they're most common is in freshwater. Um, the Southern California population as of 2003 was around 5,000 pairs. My just completely made up guess is that there's maybe 500 speed, uh, pairs in the mainland LA County. Um, and that's enough so that pretty much any freshwater habitat, any freshwater lake is gonna have at least you know a few around most of the time. Any, I should say any lake that has fish. If it doesn't have fish, it won't have cormorant. Um, and it, so any cormorant that you see away from the immediate coast is almost certainly this species, just like any cormorant you see on salt water is almost certainly a brant. Um, and surprising to me is that they um, breed on the Channel Islands with, where there isn't a ton of fresh water, um, including Anacapa, Anacapa where there's no fresh water. So um, that was something I learned that I didn't know. Uh, okay, so the rarer of the this, this pair is the neotropic. So this is the species which it has only recently kind of invaded or expanded into Southern California. Our first record in LA County that I know of was in 2016 at uh, Benelli Pudding Stone Re Reservoir. And um, since then, they've just been increasing. Probably by you know next week, they'll be breeding in your backyard. But um, as of right now, they, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe there's 10 pairs or something like that in LA County. Um, so the, they're, um, they're increasing rapidly and there's no reason to, that I know of to think that that's gonna slow down. <clears throat> um, you know, even 15 or 20 years ago, they were very rare in California, even at the Salton Sea and Colorado River, but they became common there. And now they're expanding in the coastal slope. Um, a good place to look for them in LA County and there's others, but you know, one is between uh, the Pacific Crest uh, Coast Highway and Willow Street on, um, the Los Angeles River. There's usually a few that hang out on the the wires that go across the river or on the um, posts down in the in the river there. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about the saltwater species, so the Brant's cormorant and pelagic cormorant. And I think often, you know, this is a confusing pair and and it poses identification challenges. Um, and then after this, I'll talk about uh, the freshwater species, the double crested and um, neotropic. So. Okay, so Brant's cormorant, again, the first thing to pay attention to is salt water. So if it's on salt water, if it's sitting on salt water, if it's floating in salt water, if it's sitting on a rock, if it's surrounded by salt water, if it's on a rock or a buoy, you know, by salt water, chances are it's a Brant's cormorant. Um, 
I, I don't, I can't remember ever having seen one of these guys sitting on a telephone wire or a tree branch the way to com double cresteds commonly do. Um, they probably do, I guess, rarely, but, um, you know, if you see something sitting on a wire, you know, that seems like a cute clue that it's maybe not a branch cormorant. They breed colonially on flat topped rocks or sloped rocks that are sea rocks, um, unlike pelagics, which breed on cliff faces. Um, this is about the same size, the body size is about the same size as the Western gull, which is again, another clue because they're, you know, somewhat bigger than uh, pelagic cormorants, which are to my eye, at least distinctly smaller than a Western gull. Um, they, the adults are all black, but in good light, they show a green gloss. Um, in breeding plumage, they have these beautiful blue throats and you can see this here. These are called guler patches and uh, they're part of the breeding um, display and part of the uh, changes that their bodies go through in the breeding season. And so the adults get these beautiful blue guler patches. Um, they have this tan line below the guler patch throughout the year and the immatures have that as well. This is an immature up in the upper um, right corner here. And this is an immature down in the water down below. And you can see they all have this kind of hint of a little tan line. Um, immatures are paler brown below and duller uh, above. They have pale edged feathers up above, which pelagics, immature pelagics look kind of more all dark. Um, and one thing that's different between brants and double crested is that brants are palest on their belly. And you can see it well in this bird here, whereas double crested are amniotropics are palest on their breast. And so this bulging kind of area of the crop in the lower neck is where a double crested would be palest and you can see it's you know dark here on this bird. Um, and there's a substantial difference between the adults and the immatures. The immatures are brown, dull, and paler than the adults. So that's actually a useful identification mark because if you see a flock flying by, you've got glossy black birds and paler brown birds and that's a good clue that you're looking at Brant's cormorant. Um, all ages show this tan colored area on the throat, even in the non-breeding season where they don't have this bright blue patch. Um, and their heads often appear chunky, thicker, um, chicker, thicker than the neck. Um, and again, when you see flights, fly, uh, groups flying by, there's usually um, a large variety between big birds and little birds and dark birds and light birds. And that's a good clue that it's Brant's cormorants and not pelagic. Um, and there, this is a monotypic species. Um, all right, so, hey, and uh, actually I should say Frank or Mark or Lance, let me know if um, we get questions in the, um, in the chat here, so I'm not keeping an eye on that. Okay, so here's some pictures of Brant's cormorants flying, and by the way, I just, I took all these photos off of eBird, but, um, you know, these aren't intended to be the world's most beautiful photos, but I think the idea is to get a bunch of photos to just, you know, help train your eye as to what are these guys supposed to look like? What do what branch cormorants look like? So these have um, a kind of an upward sloped body. So when they're flying, you can see that they normally kind of hold their head up higher than their body. The head has a kink, the neck has a kink in it. Um, the head is thick and there's kind of a, usually there's sort of a thinner point in the neck back behind the, the thickest part of the head. Um, on many of these birds, even when they're pretty distant, you can see the little uh, tan spot there on the on the chin or on the throat. And that's usually a pretty good clue. They also look, um, compared to pelagic cormorants, they look heavier, clumsier, they have a harder time getting in the air. And um, when a bunch of them are flying by, as I mentioned, they you know look uh, very variegated um, as a group. Okay, so I'm gonna, flip forward. Okay, so pelagic cormorant. Um, so a pelagic cormorant is a smaller, daintier, uh, thinner, lighter version of a uh, branch cormorant. They're, they're close relatives, but they, um, you know, they're definitely a smaller bird. They're uh, something like 20% to 25% uh, smaller than a branch cormorant. So it's enough that it's pretty noticeable in the field. Um, and when I say 25%, that's in terms of length or wing spread or weight you know they're they're just smaller birds um so again saltwater only saltwater 
Yeah, I mean, even these guys are even more strictly coastal than pelagics. You won't even find these guys in harbors normally. Um, I mean, it can happen, but these guys live on the ocean. They live on cliffs by the ocean, and that's pretty much it. Um, so they, unlike brands, they breed colonially on cliffs. So typically, you know, La Jolla is a famous place where these guys have a colony. Um, they're, they're also less variable in size than brants. Um, they're distinctly smaller body than Western gulls. So often if you don't see a brant sitting next to a pelagic, but you see, you know, there's always a Western gull somewhere around. Um, so, you know, if you use that as your point of reference, these guys are distinctly smaller than Western gulls versus brants, which are sort of in the same size range as Western gulls, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, they, they look all dark. So oftentimes, um, the, the immatures, in the, you know, in bad light, you can't even tell sometimes the immatures from the adults. They're, they're, they're much darker, the immatures are, than, um, than the immature brands. They have a thin head and a thin bill, and they, you know, the thing that bird watchers always say is they have this kind of snake-like uh, head shape, where the head, especially in flight, is hardly thicker than the body. I'm sorry, the head is hardly um, thicker than the neck, so it creates this kind of weird snake-like, uh, you know, front end. Uh, <clears throat> now, fortunately, some of the time they're the easiest cormorants to identify because in the breeding season, the adults have red faces, bright white spots on the sides of the rump, and they often appear crested. So, you know, when you see a cormorant flying by, and you can see it here in this picture that you see these breeding birds with um, this white spot on the lower flank or the sides of the rump, um, you know, that's a pelagic cormorant. Nothing else around here shows that. Um, and that's a, actually a, a really good way to get to know the flight styles because you see one of those birds, you know, there's no question as the identification and you can, you know, focus on the structure and, and learn it that way. Um, so uh, one th thing that's interesting about these guys is they have um, a much better uh, aerodynamic properties than uh, that Brant's cormorants do. And they're actually the only cormorant in our area that can, that can jump directly into flight. So they can, they don't need to do a long run to get going. They can they can take off and jump directly into the air. So if you see a cormorant on the ocean do that, that's probably going to be a pelagic cormorant. That's certainly going to be a uh, pelagic cormorant. Um, and these guys are uh, monotypic typic species. Okay, so here's some uh, flight photos of these guys. And here you can see this uh, snake-like um, neck shape and head shape that I was describing where the head is, first of all, a lot thinner proportionately or, or less tall proportionally than with the Brant's cormorant. But, um, but also because of that, you know, the, even the thinnest point in the neck is barely thicker or th barely thinner than the uh, thickness of the head. So it creates this, um, I mean, really kind of odd look almost like, it, you know, tube or something for a snake. Um, they also have kind of a shorter, thinner bill. Uh, so, so they create it. They can create a considerably different look. Now, what I find when I'm birding is, um, well, you know, you think, okay, that's fine. And sometimes you see a bird fly by, and there's no doubt, pelagic cormorant. You know, it's got this thin, skinny neck. Doesn't look anything like a branch cormorant. It's totally obvious. And if you can see the red face or any of this other stuff, then it's really clear. But a lot of times. It, I find it a little bit um, confusing and they're birds that are kind of intermediate. Um, so I was gonna do a little bit of a comparison between pelagic and the pelagic here on the left and the brants are on the right. Now, obviously these birds with bright white flank patches are gonna be pelagics and there's nothing confusing about them. But, um, and, and similarly with the brants, if you can see the tan throat patch or other stuff, they're not gonna be confused about that. But if they're far enough away, they can be hard to tell. And some of these brands, particularly if you see a flock go by, there's one little tiny bird in there that's got kind of a skinny neck and you're thinking, is that a pelagic? Um, and, and sometimes I, I find them confusing. And so I just wanted to you know, focus in on a few things here. Um, so first of all, if you see a whole bunch of birds flying by and one of them small, probably those are all brands cormorants because they, they too tend to kind of segregate. I mean, they, they do sometimes fly together, but they won't fly together for long periods of time. Cormorants, because they have uh, very, you know, they, they can barely fly. You know, they, their weight to wing size ratio is, is unfavorable. So they can 
they can barely keep themselves afloat. So what they do is they employ the strategy where they fly in a line and they just like, you know, geese or some other birds do pelicans, they, they take advantage of the, um, of the disturbance of the air that the bird in front of them makes to get a tiny little bit of a updraft and that helps them be more efficient when they're flying. And so when you see a cormorants flying, they fly in a line the way, you know, a lot of other seabirds do. And when they do that, typically brants and pelagics will segregate from each other because brants flap their wings at different rates than pelagics. They are different size. So I think that aerodynamic, um, you know, assist probably doesn't work as well. That's just me guessing, but um, they do tend to kind of segregate and they fly differently. So anyway, let me, uh, let me focus on this for a second. So first thing to notice is, yes, you know, sure enough, you, I, I hope you guys can see this, but, you know, you know, some of these brands have really big chunky heads that look blocky and are clearly kind of maybe even a little bit kinked in the neck or they, you know, clearly to me, to my eye, look pretty different than a pelagic. And some of the pelagics have little tiny heads and very snake-like and it's super obvious. However, some, you know, look almost the same. I, I highlighted two birds here that, you know, you can hardly tell the difference. I mean, this one has a little tan throat patch, so I know it's a pelagic, and this one has a little glossy green spot on the side of its ear, so I know it's a, uh, I'm sorry, I know this is a branch, and I know this one's a pelagic, but from a shape standpoint, they're pretty similar, and these kinds of birds uh, can confuse you, can certainly can confuse me when we're out in the field, so um, you know, in that case, the things to think about are what's, what are the other birds it's flying with? If it's with a group of brants, it's probably a brants. If it's with a group of pelagics, it's probably a pelagic. If it's by itself, well, you got to start looking for other marks. Um, another thing is that the pelagics really look thinner overall. The wings are thinner, they're more pointed, um, they flap them faster, and, um, you know, there, there's, there's other differences like that. Uh, I'll talk about those in a couple more slides. Um, here's, uh, here's another thing. So, you know, like I've mentioned a lot of times, even at a pretty good distance, you can see this little tan throat spot on a pelagic. Um, and similarly with, um, I'm sorry, I keep, I'm going to, this is going to drive everyone crazy. Brands, sorry. You can see the little tan throat spot, spot on brands. Um, you know, in fact, all these birds, all these photos, even though the photos are pretty bad, pretty far away, pretty, you know, blown up, um, you can still see a hint of that little pale patch on all these guys. Pelagics don't have any hint of a pale throat. They have red faces, they have jet black throats, and if anything, they might have a little bit of a pale spot on the ear, which is, I think, more of a reflection than anything else, but, you know, between the combination of the red face and that little reflection spot on the ear, you know, that's often something you can actually see. And, um, you know, obviously if they have white patches, that's gonna be a dead giveaway. So, you know, if, if you see a bird that's confusing, is it snake-like, is it bulky? You no, know, it's somewhere in between. This is the thing that I, I look for. Um, and again, obviously if it has a white spot on the flank, then, then you don't have to wonder very much about the identification. And if it's an adult and it's in um, the, uh, you know, April to June timeframe and it doesn't have that, then you can be pretty sure it's a brand. Okay, now one thing that is, I think, consistently different about brands versus pelagics is that pelagics have kind of a smoother profile on the belly and the neck. Um, and surprisingly, you know, it's, I guess it kind of looks subtle in these, but but I when I'm out birding, I kind of find that uh, to be um, a, a useful mark. Um, brands just I don't know how to describe it. They just look lumpy and um, gangly, and they and like the middle part of their throat kind of hangs down, and then their belly hangs down, and it forms this angle, and it contributes to this overall impression of kind of a blocky head and a you know wobbly neck and, um, you know, this neck kind of hanging down from the body, whereas a pelagic has um, more of a straight line. It's still not straight. It still kind of wiggles a little bit, but uh, I don't know, you know, if other people see that, but for me, that's something I find pretty noticeable. Um, 
Okay, so uh, one thing I wanted to throw out there was just to give a sense of the size comparison. Um, again, you know, Brands versus Pelagic have about a 20% difference in size. And this photo in the on the right here gives a sense of that. So the upper bird is a Brants and the lower bird, you know, both of the lower birds are Pelagics. And you can see that it's a, it's a thinner, smaller bird than a Brants. Um, and on average, that's about a 20% difference. I think probably, you know, Brants are pretty variable. So probably there's some birds that are only 10% bigger and some birds that are probably 30% bigger. Um, but, uh, you know, normally when you see a pelagic with Brants, it's, it's pretty obvious that there's a size difference. Um, and then Brants is, uh, although I was surprised to find that they're heavier than uh, double crested, when I see them in the field, I'm normally, yeah, I'm normally struck by the impression that they seem smaller than double crested. Um, but, you know, I think we can probably compromise and say they're about the same size. Um, and, and while we're on this subject of size, neotropics again are about 30 or 40% smaller than double crested, which is a really big difference and very noticeable, uh, even sometimes without direct comparison. All right. Um, okay, so again, when you see any kind of cormorant, but it, certainly when you see branch cormorants, you're gonna see a group of them in all probability. And the characteristics, the characteristics of the group are really important for uh, identifying, you know, the individuals in the group because typically they segregate and typically the groups are, you know, one one species. So, brands color contrast between adults and immatures is usually pretty obvious. Again, immatures have that pale be pale belly and they have kind of paler brown above. There's substantial size variation, so they're big birds and little birds. Um, there's usually at least a few birds that show that obvious pale tan you know, patch on the throat. In fact, if you can get a good enough look, they probably all have that. And usually, often, there's one or two birds that look kind of small and skinny and thin-necked, and you think, is that thing a pelagic? But no, if it's with a group of brants, it's going to be a brant in all probability. Um, and in general, they appear heavier. They seem like they have a hard time getting in the air. They seem like they have a hard time kind of staying in the air. Um, they require a running start, um, and they, they they seem like they just they don't want to do any more than necessary. So they fly low on the water, and they go where they're going. Plagics, on the other hand, as a group, you know they have faster wing beats. They appear smaller, lighter, more agile. A lot of times when plagics are flying, they you know they kind of twist and do stuff. They'll go up and fly 20 feet above the water, and then go back down. Um, they'll lift their head and look around while they're flying, which is actually kind of a, a characteristic uh, movement that they do. I mean, France will do that a little bit, but pelagics kind of constantly do that. They're just looking around. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the, you know, again, some of the birds will show red, you know, red faces or they'll show white flank spots. Um, and uh, they, again, fly more easily and they can get up off the water without a running start. So when you see a group together, it's often much easier to identify them than, than seeing an individual bird. And if there is one bird that's in the other species, it's usually pretty obvious because it'll take off and go in some other direction and won't fly with the group. All right. Okay, so so that's it for the saltwater cormorants. Now I'm going to talk about the, the freshwater cormorants, the double-crested and the neotropic. So you start with the double-crested. The double-crested is the common one in LA County. And um, these are the birds that you're going to see in estuaries, um, but especially in lakes, freshwater lakes where there's fish. Um, so <clears throat> they they like to you know perch in all the same places that branch cormorants do. They sit on rocks, they sit on breakwaters, they sit on buoys, they do all that sort of stuff. But they also like to perch on the ground. A lot of times you go to a lake and they're just perched on the side of the shore right by the lake. Um, they like to perch on trees. They like to perch on power lines. These are things that cormorants, you know, uh, brants and pelagic cormorants never, as far as I know, do. Um, they breed colonially in trees. So if you see a bunch of cormorants up in a tree, that's going to be one of these freshwater species. And in LA County, that's probably going to be a double crested. Um, they, they also vary tremendously in size. Um, and again, you kind of have this problem where if you see a, you know, a bunch of double crested, there's one really small one, you're thinking, that might be a neotropic, so just be cautious because they, they do vary a lot in size. Um, both the double-crested and the um, neotropic have this 
big blocky head, kind of a heavy front end look to them with a big head and then a kink in their neck. And we'll see that in a minute in the flight pictures. But um, between the kink in the neck and then the bright orange facial skin and the gular patch, they are usually instantly identifiable as not, you know, one of the saltwater species. And so usually when you're, if you're out at the ocean and you see what uh, one of these guys go by, it's usually immediately obvious because of that orange facial skin and the, and the, the you know, heavy head look. Um, <clears throat> so the adults are, you know, all black. The immatures uh, are very, extremely variable. So um, again, Unlike the brants, which is palest on the belly, these guys are palest on the breast. So um, uh, when you see a flock of double crested, you'll see black birds, which are the adults, but then you'll see birds, which are, you know, just a little bit paler, you know, brown and dull, but, but just a little bit paler, all the way to birds that have nearly white breasts. And so that kind of really um, contrasting, uh, appearance of a flock is is a good indication that these are double crested because um, neotropics are, are more uniform and the immatures are much darker um, or not much darker they're they're darker um, okay so in the breeding season um, these guys have uh, orange gular patches but their face and their or their um, gular patch is pretty much going to be orange throughout most of the year so it's um, it's usually a pretty um, pretty obvious uh, uh, you know, thing with these guys throughout the year. It's not just like the, it's not like the brands where their cooler patch is only um, blue at, you know, during the breeding season, or at least only bright blue in the breeding season. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's interesting, I think, about the double crested is that they have this thing called a um, phyllo plume, which is, you know, where they get their name double crested. So they have these like crests that come up on the side. Um, I guess I'm a little bit like that myself, but they uh, they have you know these streaks of of hair like feathers that come up on the side, and if you look at all the different subspecies, there's four subspecies in North America. Um, they vary primarily in the shape and the color of those plumes. So, in some populations like the extreme Pacific Northwest, they're white and straight and um, bold, and in parts of other parts of the United States, they're white and curly. And in Southern California, what we have is um, two subspecies. And the one that occurs where uh, we are is called albo, albo ciliatus, but it has anywhere from white filiplumes and, or, you know, white crests to black crests and everything in between. And normally what they have is some white feathers and some black feathers that are generally pretty straight. Um, as you get down into the southeastern corner of the state, you get the nominate uh, our uh, um, aritium, and that is uh, straight um, blackish plumes mostly. So, and this is only in the breeding season. So, most of the time, it's not useful, and you can't really identify these guys as species. Um, this is what a breeding colony looks like here. So, um, and this shows kind of a you know difference between an adult and a uh, immature. And again, you can see that it's palest on the upper breast, unlike the Brant's cormorant. Okay, so these are a bunch of double crested cormorants in flight. Um, so a couple of things to point out here. So first of all, you can see this uh, kink in the neck in almost every uh, bird here. So, you know, they have kind of a big angular, weird, you know, kind of pterodactyl -y sort of head look where they've got a big head that goes back and then it goes, you know, it, it does this weird little jog. And um, that's very characteristic of both um, of the freshwater species, so double crested and neotropic. One thing that I think is, is you know, usually pretty visible, even with a bird that's flying by, is um, that the facial skin is, is much more pronounced on the double crested than it is on the uh, on the neotropics. So even though it seems like a really minor thing, this little bit of skin that's in front of the eye, the lores area, is often quite visible. And um, this is consistently orange in double crested and consistently dark 
in um, neotropics. So that's a pretty good mark. It's not 100%, but you know, it's it's a pretty good mark. Okay, so um, here are some more double crested cormorants. These guys are perched. So again, it gives you a sense for the variation in the uh, color of the breast and the different times of year. I'm not trying to get into all the details of you know the sequence of plumages or all that, but but it does give you a sense for you know the, the look at these two immatures in the middle. You know, one's quite dark and one's quite pale. But again, that upper breast is um, quite noticeably pale. And in all of these birds, the lores, there's there's a distinct orange spot on the lores. One other thing that I'll point out, which um, often isn't visible in the field, but you know can be can be visible sometimes, is immatures start out with somewhat pointy feathers, and the adults end up with these rounded feathers. I mean, they're still kind of long, but the tips are are rounded. In neotropic cormorants, the tips, uh, even in adults, are pointed. So that's um, that can be a useful feature in some weird situations where you get a bird that's you know, intermediate. Okay, neotropic cormorant. So, <clears throat> um, as I, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't know if there are other parts of the country where there's some subtle segregation of habitat between neotropic and uh, double crested, but in LA, they essentially inhabit the same sorts of habitats. Um, again, like double crested, they vary a lot in size. Um, breeding adults are pretty distinctive. They have this bold white border to the guler patch. The guler patch is small. Um, the, the bill is gray, although I personally find that mark, although I know a lot of field guys talk about it, I, I find that kind of hard to see and hard to interpret. But, um, but nonetheless, the overall impression is not of as much like bold orange color the way the face of a double crested does. But but this white V at the rear of the guler patch is usually pretty obvious. You can see even on this immature, there's a little hint of that. Um, and you can see the very pointed feathers of this immature, which immature double crested have pointed feathers too, but these are substantially more pointy on the on the back and the and the wing covers. Um, okay, so typically when we're looking at a uh, neotropic in LA, we're trying to think, okay, why is this thing not a double double crested cormorant, which would be the expected species? So typically, often when you see a neotropic, it's going to be with other cormorants, and in all probability, those other cormorants are going to be double crested cormorants. So um, typically, it's going to be smaller, it's going to have a longer tail. To me, uh, if you've birded in the east or birded in Florida, they remind me of a anhinga with a really long tail. They're not that extreme, but they, they give me that impression a little bit. And we'll talk about that more in a second. They lack the bright orange lures. So you can see like this, these birds, you know, range from having an entirely all dark feathered laurel area to, you know, maybe a hint of a paler skin color, but, and, I, and I've heard that they can be orange in that area, but, you know, it's not like double crested, which have bare skin, which is bright orange a lot of the times. Um, V-shaped rear end to the guler patch, more rounded crown and nape. The smaller bill can give, you know, what some people call a cute impression. I remember my, my friend Dan Cooper describes it as a pushed in face look, um, but, you know, short, compact, rounded. Um, <clears throat> they have, if you see a bunch of birds on a wire, one thing that is sometimes obvious is that um, the neotropics have much thinner, smaller legs and feet. And uh, you can you can easily identify them just from the feet. It's it's kind of funny, but it really you know um, if these are these are birds that are thirty or forty percent smaller than a double crested, so it doesn't take as much leg to you know hold them up. <clears throat> um, the immatures are darker, so you can see that this is a pretty typical immature, and they don't vary as much as a double crested do. So you know most immatures are going to look pretty much like this, and you can see that you know, this is a much darker bird um, than most immature uh, double crested. So that's often a good mark. If you see a if you see a bird and you're trying to figure out, huh, is this thing a double crested or a neotropic? If it has a pale belly or breast, it's it's not a neotropic in all, you know, in all likelihood. Um, again, field guides mentioned bill color, but I, I find that hard to use. It varies by time of year, it varies by age, and I don't know, I don't find it helpful. 
Um, <clears throat> and then again, back feathers are more pointed than similar age double crested cormorants. And this is particularly helpful with adults, you know, where some some of the adults can be kind of confusing if you're if you're seeing it from close. All right. So now these are neotropic cormorants in flight. Um, again, they have this kind of heavy front end, a kink in the neck. Um, you know, they 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 sometimes show some obvious uh, orange on the guler patch, but in general, they have less, you know, kind of a obvious flash of orange from a long distance, um, and they have a longer tail. Um, so on the next slides, oh yeah, so first of all, I'll show, here's, here's a bunch of birds perched. Again, you can see the immatures are all pretty dark. So these are much more uniform than the, than the double crested, which varied to almost white on the breast. These are, these are much more uniform. And they all have dark roars, um, and they all have this kind of distinctive uh, guler patch shape. Um, short bills, rounded head, cute appearance. Um, you know, they're all kind of subtle features, but once you've seen them a couple of times, I think that maybe starts to make sense. And this is why I like a bunch of photos because I think, uh, you know, for me at least, it, it, it's a helpful way for me to, you know, kind of get um, the marks that we're trying to look for. Okay, so. This gives you a sense for the size difference between uh, double crested and neotropic, and it's substantial. When you see two together, you know usually it's it's pretty clear. So, um, as you might expect, you know this is a neotropic, much smaller body, dark war, smaller bill, white V at the rear of the throat. All it, you know, not a great photo, so it's not obvious, but you can you know you can see that's a pretty pretty clear bird. Um, and again, you know, here's a bunch of uh, Cormorants sitting on a, on the ground. Um, so two of these are neotropics, and you can see again dark lures, um, much smaller, longer tail, rounded crown, short bills, um, and you know again you look at the double crested, orange lures, um, you know big long bills, bigger bodies. Um, so it's usually uh, pretty clear when you see them together. Okay, so again, I'm doing a side-by-side -side comparison. So these guys on the left here are neotropics and these guys on the right are double crested. So, um, you know, the, the differences are somewhat subtle, but I, I, I would say for me, my impression is that when a cormorant flies by, even when it flies by at a fairly good distance, I usually either have if I, if I can see it from the side, which is kind of what you need to see it, where you need to see it to be able to, you know, get a good look at it for, for these purposes, you can usually get a pretty good sense that's a double crest or that's a neotropic. And the biggest thing is, is going to be the length of the tail relative to the length of the head and, you know, whether you, you know, how, how prominent the orange is on the face, particularly if you can see if it has any orange on the lores or not. Um, usually it's, if you can see the orange on the lowers, then it's double crested. If you can't see the orange on the lowers, then you don't really know because maybe it's just too far away. But if you can see it, then you know it's not a neotropic. Okay, so um, I know some people have told me that they have trouble uh, seeing this, this tail head proportion thing. But to my eye, what this looks like, and I'll flip back, what this looks like, and I'll if we look at this bird, here, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but if you if we look at this bird here in the um, upper, uh, well, I guess in the middle upper uh, on the left side, the, the the neotropic, it looks to me like the head and the tail stick out about as far in front of the wings as they do behind the wings. So the tail sticks out about as far. There's about as much of the bird behind the wings as there is in front of the wings, and with double crested. It looks to me like there's considerably more of the bird in front of the wings relative to the you know the amount of tail behind the wings, and you know these things vary, but um, in the field I, I I find that pretty easy to see. Um, so I I drew it on a couple of these birds where we've got kind of a good clean look at it. You know this bird on the bottom also is pretty clear, but it's it's sort of in the neighborhood of equal for the neotropics, right? Um, and with the double crested, it's 
to my eye, clearly more um, out in front of the wings than behind the wings. So, you know, again, when you see double crusted cormorants fly by, you know, home in on that and take a look at that and uh, see if that's something that, you know, makes sense to you. All right. Another thing is, again, you know, you can often pick up on this orange patch on the on, on the lures. And in some cases, you can see them well enough to be sure, like, you know, these, these birds don't have it in the case of some of these, um, you know, tropics. Okay, so, um, you know, again, like with brants, cormorants, and pelagics, sometimes just looking at the group from a whole, even if they're so far away that you can't see any of these things, is enough to uh, identify them. And in this case, this is a group of double crested cormorants. How do we know? Because, first of all, they're all about the same size. None of these birds is obviously 30 or 40 percent smaller than the other. So, you know, they're probably all one species. I'm going to assume this is freshwater, but the key thing is the breasts of some of these birds are nearly white. Um, they vary from, you know, all black to mostly dark to, you know, gray, grayish white on the breast. And the only the only cormorant that does that is double crested. So again, you can look at that and say with pretty high confidence, all of these birds are double crested cormorants. Even if you can't see any of these marks, you can't see along the tail edge, you can't see them in flight or anything just because some of the birds are, you know, light breasted. Um, so that, um, that's really it. I um, hope that was helpful, but uh, happy, to, happy to take questions or, you know, corrections on anything I said or additional information or marks that I, you know, that you guys find helpful that I didn't mention. So um, Ron or Mark, do we have any questions? Um, yes, we do. Thank you so much, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Um, and we do have, we have a question from Sequoia who asks, uh, uh, do um, double crested cormorants have orange faces and orange ghoulers even in the non-breeding season? Yes, they do. Yeah, I, the, the the intensity certainly changes, and I and you know you can look at the photos that I showed, and in the breeding season, I mean it's almost kind of ludicrously brilliant um, and contrasty. But but even in the non-breeding season, it's still obviously orange. It gets kind of more yellowy orange in in the non-breeding season. And great, thank you. And another question from Sequoia: What about the white V on the rear end of the guler patch in neotropic is what happens to that in the non-breeding season is that still visible yeah so that um is is very very bold in the breeding season and you know it can be even nearly absent in the non-breeding season usually there's at least a hint of it but um uh but even when it's absent you can still kind of see the the shape difference because because in a neotropic it comes back in a v and then goes back forward under the bottom and in a and double crested it just kind of forms this it like goes back and then it just kind of curves and goes straight down more or less so um but it doesn't form that sharp angle now mark i'm sure that you could agree if you stare at enough double crested, you can get yourself confused because you can find birds that are like everywhere in between. But as a as a generalization, when you see a neotropic, it's usually kind of obvious. And if you certainly see that combination of a sharp angle plus some hint of a white border, you know that's going to be a neotropic. So yeah, all I I tried not to focus as much on marks that you know come and go with the seasons, um, but uh, you know, but yeah, they, they do um, look noticeably different in the, you know, a breeding season and a non-breeding season. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Oh, now we have a question from Susan. Um, what are the main things to look for if you think that you might have a neotropic hybridized with a double crested? And that's a, that's a hard, you know, question. And, um, Andy Birch found a bird like that recently um, that I think probably was a hybrid from, you know, what I can tell. Um, so, I mean, it's like looking for hybrids for a lot of things and hybrids do occur and hybrids are certainly here in LA. Um, 
they show a combination of characteristics. So the hybrids that, um, I mean, when, when you identify anything, you, you want to look for a combination of field marks. So if you want to see a, cor a you know, a uh, neotropic cormorant, you think that's a neotropic cormorant, it's going to be 30 or 40% smaller than a double crested. It's going to have a V shape. It's going to have a hint of white. It's going to have, you know, a short bill and a long tail and all this stuff. And, you know, when, um, you know, when you see a hybrid, it's kind of like that, but it doesn't quite make sense. You know, the shape of the throat isn't quite right or yeah. the, you know, the, you know, in the case of Andy's bird, it was it was pretty much like a double a neotropic, but it was, you know, it had big feet and the overall bird was nearly the size of the double crested. Um, and so, and, and, and the, the giveaway, I think the dead giveaway was that it had mostly, you know, the, the guler shape and characteristics of a neotropic, but then it had the, the whiskers, the double crest plumes, or at least a few hints of those of a, of a double crested, because when a double crested are up here on a neotropic, they're, they're on the cheeks. And um, so, yeah, I know that's not a great answer. And, <laughs> And hybrids vary, but it's, you know, they're kind of halfway in between. They show characteristics of both typically. Oh, that, that is a great answer. Yeah. That is. Um, let's see, any more questions? Well, over yeah. in the chat, Russell Stone asks, is there anything distinctive about uh, different cormorants when they're in the water, such as the way they float, whether uh, more buoyant or not, or behavior maybe? Um, so I didn't focus on the identification of these birds in the water, but um, I think you know the marks that we talked about are sufficient to identify these guys in the water is if you're if you're close enough. So if um, you know, so if, if the bird's close enough, you know all the the things we talked about about the shape of the guler patch and the you know the white and all this stuff is going to help you identify and the the laurel patch is going to help you identify neotropic versus. Um, double crested um, and, you know, almost the same as if it was sitting on the land. Right. Um, with Brant's versus pelagic, again, you know, kind of that, that shape of the head is uh, distinctive with pelagics um, versus Brant's. Um, one thing, and, and, and this is kind of a cop out, I guess, but um, normally when you see uh, you know, so the, the where this would get difficult is if you got a hump, uh, cormorants that are way out in the water in the ocean, and you're sitting on the shore, and you got a telescope, and you're like, "What the heck are these little black dots?" Um, the good news is the cormorants don't normally spend a ton of time just sitting on the water. They won't just sit there for like 12 hours the way western grebes will or something. Usually, when they're out in the water, they're feeding. When they're not feeding, they want to go sit on a rock somewhere, and so. If they're feeding, what they'll do is they'll dive and they'll and they'll fly over, you know, 100 yards down there and they'll fly back and then they'll go down and they'll pop up and you'll see them moving around. And so when you see them fly, then, you know, you'll be able to get, um, even if they're so distant, you can't even see anything about them. Usually that'll give you at least enough idea to make an educated guess. And by the way, they're going to be France cormorants. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, another question. Uh, Yvonne asks, anatomically, can you explain the presence of the noticeable kink versus no kink on the basis of vertebral structure? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm just not knowledgeable enough to do it. But yes, I'm, I'm sure you could. I mean, they're different uh, genera, right? So they are evolved to, you know, hunt different kinds of fish. They're hunting in different environments. They're breeding in different environments. Um, they're different sizes, so um, you know it's not. It wouldn't be surprising that they would be different in all kinds of ways um, in their skeletal structure. So yeah, I'm I'm sure there's some important difference. Um, you know, with the way it looks to me is that double crested cormorants just look like they have this big honking head, and you know it takes like a you know, a suspension bridge to keep the thing out of the water. So, <laughs> yeah. David, can you, can you say anything about vocalizations? Is there any? Yeah, you know, um, cormorants uh, do, vo well, so the short answer is no, I can't really say anything, except to say that they do vocalize, um, 
you know, they vocalize when they're, you know, tussling for space on the rock. They vocalize as part of their um, courtship. You know, if you go to a colony, you'll hear like a cacophony of, you know, calls coming from the cormorants. And I'm sure they're different, but, um, you know, when you're close enough to, to hear any of those things, you're usually close enough to identify them easily visually. So um, I have to just admit that it's not something I've ever paid close attention to myself. And Naresh points out that um, pelagic cormorants seem to him to dive around in the surf a lot, kind of like scoters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, pelagic cormorants are interesting. They are strictly near, near shore species. They are, they're clearly specialists <laughs> in that near shore hunting you know, environment. Um, and I guess that makes sense. Maybe they're, they're smaller, they're more agile, you know, they're more adapted to, you know, kind of hunting in close quarters, whereas brants are specialists at hunting, you know, 200 yards offshore to 20 miles offshore. Um, and they're, you know, they're going to be in deeper water, you know, chasing stuff. Now, um, brants will come in close to shore also on occasion, but um, you're right, you know, those pelagics are they're specialists of that habitat for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another question from Yvonne. Uh, are cormorants partially waterproof, but not to the same <laughs> extent as other water birds? Yeah, so I mean, that that's, yeah, that's something I didn't mention. <clears throat> um, cormorants do have this funny characteristic where they will come out of the water and then sit and dry themselves off. You know, which ducks don't need to do because, you know, water rolls off their back, you know, um, but but cormorants seem to get um, waterlogged. I mean, they get they get waterlogged to the point where they have our time flying and um, they get waterlogged enough that when they get out, they need to, you know, dry themselves off in the sun. Um, so. Yeah, I don't I don't know the underlying reason for why they do that, but you know what I assume is that they uh, you know they spend a lot of time underwater and they hunt and probably not carrying a bunch of trapped air underwater with them makes it easier for them to be fast and efficient you know swimmers. Sure, sure, that's the reason I always thought or always was told. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, then Yvonne asks. Is there any location you know where they are, maybe, I, mean, I guess this must be pelagics, are really the predominant cormorant? Um, I mean, no. Um, you know, even in areas where they have colonies like La Jolla, there's still a lot of branch cormorants, typically. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, pretty colonial and they don't, um, they don't wander very far. I mean, I guess in theory, a pelagic cormorant could show up anywhere on the coast of LA, you know, certainly looking at eBird, there's reports along the entire coast of LA, but, you know, they do tend to stick around their um, breeding colonies, even in the non-breeding season. Um, the best place that I know of to see them, but I'd love to hear Mark and Naresh and other people you probably know, but, um, you know, like Terranea Trail along the um, Palos Verdes Peninsula is one spot, you know, yeah. where I see them. Um, Point Furman. Mm-hmm. I mean, even at Point Furman, you got to kind of look, and most of the birds you see are going to be brants, but you can right, usually right. But there's a little can, place where they sit on the cliff there. Yeah, yeah. You can, and you can you can find them there. You can you know you, you you again you look you know if you're if you're on Point Furman and you're looking out on the ocean out there, you're never going to see pelagic cormorants. Mm -hmm. You got to be looking like down there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, Leo Carrillo. There's uh, often you know a few there. But yeah, still, so yeah, mostly mostly brands. Yeah. Looks good. And uh, I think we're out of questions. David, thank so. you very, very much for presenting for us tonight. This was a wonderful discussion. Sure, I hope it was helpful. Yep. For yeah, thank you so much. Um, and, and I just want to remind everyone that we'll uh, next next webinar uh, on the second Tuesday, second or third Tuesday of next month. And on uh, the first one, we'll have Dan Cooper and second one, Marky Mutchler.
and mm -hmm. please please join us and if you're not a member please consider joining the lab we appreciate your support and we need your support and lots of comments are coming in about a wonderful wonderful talk david thank you again all right well, yes well, thank you and and let me yeah, thanks, also david. bring up yes thanks david let me also bring up that the uh the september 24th pelagic is now full um but there is a waiting list and so you know every once in a while people need to cancel for some reason so if you go to the sign up page uh it will say that it's full and it'll have a little thing that you can sign up on the waiting list and um so if you're interested please do that and um and then you might still get on the trip uh if people cancel sounds good and with that thank you all for joining us and again thank you david and we will see you all at the next webinar take care everyone yep thank you dave bye thanks bye. david bye. great job good night <laughs>